I did so many things that were mistakes to get to be this person today. And I'm glad because this person today actually found her person by going through all that stuff I did. I really prepared to be his wife without knowing it because now he gets the healthiest version, the remission version, the person who's like literally not up and down every day. Let's talk about dating a borderline. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to my channel. My name is Brittany Simon. In today's podcast, we're doing a reaction video. Before we jump into the video, I am drinking a tea today and I am drinking organic red clover tea. Okay, so this video is a Dr. K video. I haven't watched Dr. K in quite some time, but he did make content on people with borderline personality disorder. And I thought, oh, let's react to that. Now for uh, clarification, I was diagnosed between 2017 and 2018 with borderline in Seattle. I worked on DBT. It really transformed and changed my life. And I highly recommend Dr. Marshall Linehan's work. Most of the bubbles tend to reject or deny the possibility that people with borderline personality disorder can get better. I'm living proof that they can. So let's go ahead and get into this. All right. So today we're going to talk about how to successfully have a relationship with someone with borderline personality disorder. So this is something that I've been wanting to talk about for a while. There's a lot of resources out there uh, for people with borderline personality disorder. There are also places like support groups um, for people who are dating people or in relationships with people with borderline personality disorder. But I've worked with a lot of people with BPD and I've worked with a lot of people who've dated people with BPD. And the truth of the matter is that oftentimes BPD is viewed as a red flag. Mm. And what a lot of people will, will get in terms of advice is that, hey, like your family and friends will tell you if someone has BPD, like you should break up with them. Okay, so really fast on this. Actually, when I was diagnosed, I didn't know what it was. I knew that people had it. I knew there were people in Seattle around me who had it, but I didn't really know what it was. You can imagine that when I was diagnosed with borderline and then I went on the internet and I found out how much people hate borderlines, it was quite scary. Here it was once again being rejected by the bubble, right? So I had to really examine myself. I was in part relieved I got diagnosed because it meant I could tackle the problem. And on the other hand, I was like, terrified that I was diagnosed because it meant that I might be the problem. And that's really scary. And so, of course, through therapy, I realized I was partially the problem, that I wasn't as healthy as I could be, that I was toxic and I invited toxicity into my life. So there is something to be said about this. Now, when I told my parents, they, of course, rejected the notion that I was sick and told me that that wasn't true, that I'm fine and beautiful the way I am, which neglects me as their daughter in some ways because I had to do this on my own. Now, I was dating somebody at the time and that relationship was not healthy. And I think we were both very unhealthy for each other. So that ended. And then I focused my time on my DBT and really recovering. And I think that that really helped, which led me down the path of actually finding my real person who is a wonderful partner and just so lovely in so many ways. But I'm telling you that there definitely is that fear of, oh, my gosh, I'm a borderline. There is a fear. But remember, your mental health does not define you. It's just a part of your story. Right, because the relationship is such a roller coaster and there are so many red flags and they're so emotionally manipulative and you're like, you're not sure what's going on. Jeez. You're dating this person. They're like, they're getting better and everything seems fine. And then you wake up tomorrow and it's like you're back to square one. It can be incredibly, incredibly like a wild ride, which can be emotionally exhausting. And so mm. the, the sad truth is that a lot of people will sort of like end up avoiding people with BPD. And it sort of Fair. makes sense because that can be a very challenging relationship to have. Mm. And this isn't really enhanced by like media depictions of BPD. Mm. So if you look at, um, you know, how the media and TV shows and movies will kind of portray people with BPD, it's usually the crazy ex-girlfriend. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people out there will sort of... Sorry, you know that show, Crazy Ex-Girlfriend? So... People told me when I was um, newly diagnosed, they're like, Brittany, look at this show. It's so relatable. I hated her. I couldn't finish it. I was so frustrated by this woman. She lied all the time. She wasn't consistent. She was so rude, up and down. Listen, and I mean this in the nicest way. Because of how I was raised, because of my personality type, I wasn't that person. Yes, I lied for survival reasons, like I didn't have money or I was gay in a conservative home, all that stuff, right? The stuff you lie about because you're afraid you might die, which is different than I think lying just to lie. Like, I mean, in this show, Crazy Ex-Girlfriend, she lies to people in ways that I'm like, oh, my ethics, my values could never allow me to lie this way. So I haven't been perfect. You guys know I've made tons of videos on the Internet about like my lying days and how I stopped lying like three, four years ago. I've put into my mantra, do not lie, though I do like to play political word games, which means I'll try to speak the truth without ever lying. But I might use words that might confuse you. Like I always joke, my mom is like five states away from me or maybe she's 10 or 15. Well, it just depends on which way you take. Right. That's kind of a lie, but it's also kind of being 
being tongue in cheek about the fact that I don't dox my location. So it's kind of like not lying, but I do play little political word games like that, which I think is fine. But some people consider lying as well. The way that Crazy Ex-Girlfriend lied in the show just really bothered me. And maybe that's why my therapist was so impressed with my not only diagnosis, but how I've handled my life. Because the truth is, is that I am a person who works two to three jobs. I usually maintain friendships just fine. I usually do very well with the people in my life. But at home, in private, I was losing it. In private, I was self-harming. In private, I was crazy. In private, I was definitely suffering. And so getting this diagnosed diagnosis helped me suffer less and it helped me not cause inconsistency with my friends and family. I think the worst part about my friends and family experiencing my borderline was probably my flakiness with my friends and my uh, emotional irregularity with my family. So I have a tendency to only feel triggered by people that I'm very, very close by. Everyone else feels indifferent to me, but I will say that because I was triggered by someone close to me or you know, because my borderline was out of control, I would then flake on my friends and I wouldn't tell them why. I just say like, I don't feel like it. I'm not feeling well, but I was really spiraling at home alone. They just didn't realize that. Mm -hmm. Sort of like, you know, they'll have a crazy ex-girlfriend who was like, was one hell of a roller coaster of a relationship. And so this is, I think, really important because people with BPD actually do get better. Um, they can yeah, form very, very wonderful, healthy relationships. I've seen yeah, we that do. happen yeah, we over can. and over again. Yes. And the truth of the matter is that sometimes we fall in love with someone who has a diagnosable mental illness. Yeah. And I don't think that it's good to just discard that person because they have a mental illness. It's understandable. And I know it's a lot to ask of a person to carry that burden. It's like when you meet a wonderful ex-military soldier who has PTSD, that can be really hard. It's like dating somebody who has borderline, which often the trauma occurs in childhood. And it's hurtful to borderlines, I think, to hear that we might be unlovable when something bad happened to us when we were kids. And because of that, now we're unlovable. That's really difficult. But you can get better. You absolutely can. You 100%, I believe in you. You can get better. Even in those moments where you're spiraling, remember that. You absolutely can get better. You can have a whole life. I am living proof of it. I have a whole functional life. I'm the breadwinner in my family. I'm consistent with my job, with my relationships. I'm honest and transparent with my partner. I'm literally, I literally, I'm telling you, you can get better, 100%. So the first thing to understand about dating someone with BPD is chances are they will get better. So the research suggests that 35% of people with BPD will actually be in remission at one year. That was me. That was me. Oh, that's me. Yes. Okay. So I got diagnosed in late 2017, 2018. Um, and within like a year or two, I think it might have been up to two years. I'll give myself a little bit more. I did hit remission. Yeah. I've been free of any problems basically since, tw I would say, Late 2019, I basically like came out of my real funk and recontextualized my life with DBT in the background. And yeah, that's oh, that makes me so happy because, guys, I was suffering for most of my life. I was so alone in my own mind. And then I got this therapist and she looked at me and she said, I get it, girl. Now we're going to get you better. And she got me better. She was so great. But mostly she believed in me. She believed borderlines could get better. And I saw that in her. And that's I owe her my life. I I really do. So that means that BPD kind of goes away after one year for about 35% of people. Yay. But what about like higher odds? So mm. if you look at people with BPD 10 years out, 91% of them are in remission. Ooh, and ooh, 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 ooh. We love this. This is great news. Because if you Google borderline, people hate people diagnosed with borderline. Kind of like hating people diagnosed with anything. It's hard. But if you're in this category of person, doesn't matter. You can get better. Don't let the world who has never had your lived experience convince you you are unlovable. You are absolutely capable of getting better. Let's go, Dr. K. Mm. They actually hit a 99% remission rate at about 16 years. So what that means is that a lot of people will think yes, that if someone is a crazy ex-girlfriend, if they stay with that person, that person will remain crazy for the rest of their lives. And this is what you have to put up with for the rest of your life. But the truth of the matter is that for the majority of people, BPD actually resolves. And the way that it resolves is by having oftentimes a stable relationship. And so the reason these people get stuck is because there's kind of too much to handle, too much of a roller coaster. They get mm. dumped. And then like the whole cycle kind of repeats itself. They feel more insecure. We'll kind of get to that. 
I will say in terms of stable relationships, I had my brother. So when I was coming out of getting diagnosed, a toxic relationship, going back and forth, choosing toxicity, in late 2019, in about October, November, I moved in with my farm brother. That's what we call him. I moved in with his wife and his multiple kids, and I worked on the farm with him. Every morning, we'd wake up at 5 a.m., and we'd go build fences, and I'd ask myself, what am I doing with my life? And the person who was the most consistent for me was my brother. And then, of course, myself. So I am always the person that I will rely on the most. But then, in turn, I also trust the people in my life, my inner circle, my brother specifically. He's my little brother, too. But he's so he's got such a strong foundation with his own beliefs. He can't be rocked. He so follows his values and is so disciplined that he could have helped somebody like me in that moment when I was out of my discipline. And he did. He did. During the six months that I lived with him before I moved out and got my own place with my other brother, I have eight brothers, um, I was working fences every morning with him. I was celibate. I wasn't smoking weed. Um, and then I wasn't masturbating. So because he's religious, he wanted me to refrain from those things while living with him. And I tried my best. I kind of smoked weed once, but he knows about that. And I masturbated twice, which he knows because we're very close as like a family. We all talk about these things very casually now. So there was a challenge to be had, but it was one of my greatest six month periods because it challenged me. It gave me consistency. It gave me support and love and a family and everything I needed. But also it helped me really face myself. And during that time, my friend was also dying of cancer and I took care of him while he died and I was there and I had like I had to call people and say like he's passed now I had to tell his wife I had to tell my brother and so it is one of those things where when you go through something outside of yourself but also to find yourself I think you have a great opportunity for growth so that consistent relationship might not have been romantic for me but it was my inner circle it was my rock it was my brother until to to, to this day my brother is the person I call if I'm ever feeling like, oh, am I regressing? Am I not in remission? Oh, am I out of recovery? So I usually call him and say, hey, like, do I sound kind of like not myself? Because he knows the Britney that I am, the real Britney, this person. And then he knows my borderline Britney. And she is different, <laughs> you know? But the first thing that I want to tell you is that if you're in a relationship with someone with BPD or you have BPD, that the good news is that actually like, you know, 99% of people are actually okay after about 16 years. Yay. And 35% of people are better after one year. So it, it kind of, you know, paces out that way. So the second thing that we have to talk a little bit about is the gender breakdown in BPD. So mm. about 75% of people who have BPD are women. And this is part of the reason why I think they're characterized this way in movies and like TV shows and stuff. Our media portrayals are usually focused on women. And that's, mm. there's like some amount of like truth to that, right? Because the majority of people who have BPD happen to be women. Some recent research is suggesting that the ratio is actually closer to one to one or 50%. Mm. And today what we're gonna talk about is some of the examples that I'll use will be sort of focused on a woman with BPD because that's most of the experience that I've dealt with. P.S. I don't know if this is true and maybe if you guys know, you can leave it down in the comment sections below. I heard a little rumor on the internet that a lot of therapists will diagnose NPD patients with BPD um, because the people with MPD don't want to admit they have it, so they'll diagnose them with borderline, so they'll get some help. And I do wonder how much of a borderline's reputation is associated with NPD, but also MPD are real people with real problems, and that is a real diagnosis, and they need help. So I'm not here to say that people with NPD can't be helped, but it is interesting the reputation each mental health uh, diagnosis can get. Insurance in America can be hard. I I paid mostly out of pocket for my therapy for my DBT. I think I got like 20 bucks off a session, which when you're paying 100 40 an hour or for 45 minutes, you know, saying something. I don't know if this rumor is true. I heard it from the internet and you know the internet lies. So, but there are absolutely cases, and we'll touch on these as well, where men can have BPD too, and those can be really challenging relationships. Mm. Okay. So don't give up hope. You don't have to dump them. We're not saying that you shouldn't dump them if that relationship isn't right for you. But I, I want to tell y'all first and foremost that having BPD, even though it can be a red flag, does not mean that it is an insurmountable problem mm. in a relationship. So let's Great. move on to understanding a couple of the core features of BPD. The first thing to understand about BPD is that these people have difficulty with emotional regulation. So if you look at the Facts. brains of people with BPD, they actually suffer more than the average human being. <laughs> and how can you say that, Dr. K? Like, oh my God, like... Isn't all suffering equal? How can we compare suffering? Like everyone is entitled to suffer. Yes, that's true. Everyone is entitled to suffering. Mm -hmm. We shouldn't compare suffering. But 
You can actually do brain scans on people with BPD. You can oh, actually that. study their reactions in their brain. Mm. And what you discover is something that's really interesting. So the amount of time that it takes the average person to feel a negative emotion is like, let's say somewhere between five and 30 seconds. People with BPD feel negative emotions more rapidly than people with normal brains. They feel those... Sorry, there was a, I want to read this. People with BPD feel emotions more intensely than neurotypical people, and this is prov provable via brain scans. So I have been wondering if I'm allowed to call myself neurodivergent because I have been using that word because I think borderline does, if it's a perceptional issue, then you do have some sort of divergency in your neurotypicalness. So I do identify as a neurotypical person, but this made me realize like, okay, good. So Dr. K is agreeing, right? That if people with BPD feel emotions more intensely than neurotypical pe people, that's because they're neuro, non-neurotypical, right? Like, is that neurodivergent? Is that what that means? I know neurodivergent is like a, a pop psych term, so I'm not sure. But I do think that people with borderline are just different. Like I do process things differently. And I'm okay with being that person, but I think that that's why I really practice like following your joy because no one can write my joy down in a book when I am a person who's obviously dealing with something a little bit atypical, right? More rapidly than people with normal brains. They feel those emotions more intensely. So they mm -hmm. feel worse faster. The measurable blood flow to the negative circuits of their brain is actually increased. <laughs> I so they that. literally feel that emotion more intensely than average. And this is the actually most damaging thing in my clinical experience is the amount of time, the duration of that negative emotional experience is way longer than mm. average. So whereas I may get really upset for like 20 minutes or 30 minutes, like after about half an hour, I'll kind of cool down. Whereas if you look at some people with BPD, they it will ruin their entire day or yeah. that negative emotional experience can last for like 24 hours sometimes even longer. When the height of my borderline, when I was really upset and before I was diagnosed, because I didn't know what it was. Um, and I also got diagnosed with PTSD around the same time. So just FYI. But when I was going through that and it would like, guys, I would have instances where something would happen. I'd be so happy. I'm so ready for my day. Everything's great. I'm going out with my friends tonight. And then something happens and all of a sudden I'm just like, I'm not going out. I don't want to do it. Like I'm not doing it. And I would just like drain all all of my happiness would just drain and nobody understood like because you know usually my boyfriends or my female partners or whoever I was dating at the time would have to deal with it the most but they'd be like oh my gosh like she just switches right and at first you're thinking like is this normal is this depression they used to think it was just depression but after I got diagnosed it made so much more sense because I would feel awful for a really long time so you can imagine what a relief it was to get diagnosed and then within two years be basically very 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 functional and now look at me now, I am like beyond functional. I'm not perfect and I definitely have moments and I definitely have to like constantly remind myself that like, hey, I know you're feeling this in this moment, but give yourself a second before you decide how you really feel about it. So this is something that's really important to understand because there's going to be a high amount of emotional activity in their brains. The second thing to understand about mm -hmm. BPD is that the way that they feel about themselves is highly tied to the way that they are treated. So if you look at the core problem of BPD, in my opinion, this is kind of my take as a psychiatrist, it is a sense of self that is not well developed. So what does this kind of mean? This means that let's say that I have like an opinion of myself, right? I believe, hey, my name is Alok. I'm like kind of like a decent dude. I'm not perfect. I'm not terrible. And so as I move through the world, I will get feedback, right? So if someone like yells at me at a grocery store, I have this sense of self which is different from the way that I'm treated. And so that mm. provides me with, with resilience. If someone calls me a piece of crap, I'm not going to believe that because I have an internal sense of self. Similarly, if someone walks up to me and is like, hey, you are the greatest thing since sliced bread. You are the Messiah. You are beautiful. You are amazing. You are perfect. I'm actually not going to believe that either because I know, hey, like I'm flawed just like any other yeah. human being. So in the case of BPD, the core problem is that their sense of self isn't very well developed, so mm. they're not as resilient. An underdeveloped sense of self results in hypersensitivity to the emotions around them. As resilient to other people's changes. And so they mm. become hypersensitive to the changes of other people. The yeah. third really, really core feature to understand about BPD, people with BPD have a huge fear of abandonment. 
And okay, so really fast. Wait, before we move on, because it so to think about like my identity, I will say I'm a person who my whole life, again, people have always told me, oh, Brittany, you should be president. Brittany, you should do this. Brittany, you should lead us here. Brittany, you should be a spokeswoman for this. Brittany, you should because I have such a dominant personality. There is this projection, even current day, Brittany. I've communicated over and over and over again what I am doing on the internet and no one believes me. Everyone always thinks like, no, she's here to lead someone or she's here to start a movement or maybe she's doing research for a book. I'm just making content to share the few things that I've learned throughout my life to better my existence, my existing. Like I am really just a content creator who likes making content and talking to people. And yeah, if I can help a few people here and there, great. But I'm not really here to be a leader. I'm here just to prove that you can get better as a person. And I'm here to be sort of a walk the walk kind of person. I am proof. I'm living walking proof that you can get better. And I want people to have that hope. And I am a person, oh, God bless you. My cat sneezed. (laughs) I am a person who tries my best to be clear about what I'm doing in spaces, but I think some people don't want to believe it. So they project it onto me like, no, you're secretly working on this, or this is what you're secretly doing. DBT really helped me not take that so offensively and not to get so frustrated. There's a very, very tight correlation between childhood trauma Mm. and the development of BPD. And chances are the nature of that trauma somehow creates a fear of abandonment within Mm -hmm. the person with BPD. Totally. Okay. So now that we understand these three core things, difficulty. So that is absolutely true for me. As you guys know, I said in the beginning of the video, I'm a queer kid. grew up in a anti-homosexual like bubble culture, background, Middle Eastern, Catholic. And I was the first child to come out as queer. I was the first cousin to come out as queer. I was the first person to, um, in a really aggressive way. I think I had one cousin prior who technically married a woman for a time. That was fun. But I think I was the first one to really like put it on YouTube and come out and say, hi, I'm queer. Like, how do we feel about this? It was quite a big deal. It's still something that gets talked about today. And then my mom and dad have 10 kids. Three of them are queer. So if you look at the diagnostic criteria for BPD, like you literally look at like how we diagnose BPD, one of the core features of the diagnosis is a pattern of intense and unstable relationships. If you look at a normal uh, relationship, it'll be kind of like a bell curve in terms of emotional experiences. So most of the emotional experiences that you have with your partner will be like kind of mediocre, right? Like Mm. you're like cooking together you're doing dishes, maybe you'll get into a little bit of a fight. Life is pretty normal with most people. The thing is, when you're dating someone with BPD, those relationships can be more U-shaped. So instead of most of the experiences being emotionally in the middle, they're actually emotionally at the extremes. You know, the experiences that you're having are like really, really wild. It's like, oh my God, on one day, like this relationship is intense and it's beautiful. It's amazing. Oh my God, we're like so in love. And it's like, so like, oh my God, this this person is the one. We spent 72 hours together and we didn't spend a minute apart. And it was like, oh my God, it was like all the movies. And then when you leave on Monday morning and you don't answer a text, it's like, oh, whoa, now we're suddenly swinging to the other end of the pendulum. What the? What's wrong with you? Why don't you text me back? Like, I thought we had something real. I thought you were the one. I thought you meant it when you said you loved me. Like, they'll say all kinds of, like, really nasty, emotionally manipulative, toxic stuff, right? And then you're like, oh, my God, this is terrible. And then you all meet again. And then she starts crying. And then you feel terrible. And you're crying. And then you got. Okay, this is really funny. Because, like, in my 20s, I did date also people who had, like, a lot of childhood trauma, people who were kind of toxic, but people who were going through it. And I had this dream that we would date each other and we would build each other up like my parents did together over 30 years. And we would be like the strong power couple. So I always dated people that I thought were like very unique and like personally driven, but only came to find out that they were less personally driven than me. And I'm a very personally driven human. I'm actually incredibly like self-reliant and resistant to, um, to the world, I tend to just follow my goals, like make a goal and complete it. First adult relationship in my early 20s with my girlfriend, she was making more than me at the time. But I always made more money. I always did like two to three jobs. I've always been a hustler while having relationships. But yeah, like one time she and I were supposed to have a date and I had dressed up and I looked really cute and we were going to go out and it was going to be really cute. And she was, we were poly at the time because I did poly for 10 years in my 20s. And she said that her boyfriend needed her attention and she chose him over me. 
And that would have to be something that I consent to, that if I was going to date her, then her primary would get focused. And I went crying to my friend's house, my guy friend's house. I have like three guy friends who are all brothers who live together. And I went to their house and I cried on their couch and I just was so upset. And they're like, you look hot. It's OK. Like she she lost out, blah, blah, blah. But what I really came to realize in that moment is that, no, I kind of need to be someone's priority the same way I want to make them a priority. So I kept dating people and I tried to do different kinds of relationships. After her, I dated a guy monogamously for two years. That was hard. That was weird. That was different than I wanted. He was also vanilla. And that was difficult in many ways. And then I dated another person who was more poly and kinky. And then we tried that. But that didn't quite work because we had different values and goals and like our ethics were different. So I was really a trial and error for me in my 20s and dating. It was high and low. It was mixed bags of emotions. But I also know I attracted pretty emotionally irregular people to me. And I was in Seattle at one point, which is like the mecca of unwellness sometimes. But also they had better language for tackling mental health. So in some ways they were better than other places compared to growing up in conservative Riverside or San Diego County. Like you're really you're given more options in Seattle at least, but then everyone is sick and everyone does have a diagnosis. So it's quite difficult. Um, but I will say that this, this does seem to be true. I mean, there were days where like my partner and I would go to the beach in Seattle and well beach and we'd, <laughs> okay. we'd go to their beach and then we'd hang out and, uh, it would be going great, great. But then he would say something like, man, like I just, I want to be home playing video games. And it would trigger me into complete depression in a spiral of borderline because I was just like, what are you talking about? We're here on the beach. We're supposed to be having a date day. Why would you say I wish I was at home playing video games? And I just felt rejected like constantly. But it was also my fault for choosing partners who didn't prioritize relationship building. Something I learned after leaving my parents' home that I never realized is not everyone is family focused and not everybody is interested in really harboring or curating really healthy relationships. A lot of people just want to stay the way they are and date someone who likes that person. But since I was in my 20s and I knew I had so much growing to do, I was always dating partners for their potential. What do we have as a potential? What are we aiming for as a couple? And when I realized all those people were actually just like chill with being where they were, I looked almost crazy for wanting to break up with them because I was like, no, like this isn't what I want. But I also, well, look at me now, right? Like I have some pretty big goals and they're not going to get accomplished if we stay stagnant. So it wasn't really an option for me. And now that I'm out of relationships like that, my my stability is actually quite good. And I would say it's more like this instead of like this. It is definitely more like a smooth wave, like of even consistency. But every day is a new day. So that's one of the skills I gave myself is like every day is a new day. Let's just do great today because, you know, I don't want yesterday to roll in today. If I had a bad day yesterday, fine, but I'm not going to roll it into today. That's a skill I learned and picked up along the way. So I'm glad my partner is the kind of person who can do that with me because, yeah, like I'm putting a lot of responsibility on him to be okay with the fact that I need every day to be a new day. And he's really good at that, too. So, yeah. Yeah, it works out. Guys, hug and then like you're together again and like you're past it all and you really do love each other and love conquers all. And then, you know, you start to get an erection and then you have makeup sex and it's like, oh my God, we're back to the other end. That's what relationship. That hot and cold relationship, I will tell you this right now. In one of my relationships, the hottest sex we ever had was the break up and get back together sex. And we were in that loop for a long time and it was not good. It's very Megan Fox, MGK energy, not healthy long term, not family focused, not really disciplined. I'm glad I'm out of it now, but I did understand why I got stuck in that loop. That toxic, re like, I hate you, I'm breaking up with you and then getting back together and being like, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. That is a drug I will never explain to you, but I will never go back. Not worth it. Absolutely toxic. Does not lead to joy. Do not recommend toxic relationships. She shows what BPD can be like. It's one hell of a ride, right? With a very, very wild emotional swing. So why does this happen? It happens because of the difficulty with emotional regulation. So what people with BPD do is when they start to feel abandoned, right? Because you had these mm. three days where y'all were joint at the hip and then you don't text someone back. What that person does is they start to feel abandoned as they. OK, I will say this, too. I have a really hard time with this or I did in the past where, yeah, like people wouldn't text me back very frequently. And I'm like, what is up with this? What is going on? And then I realized over time I really need to meet people where they're at and decide who are they. 
So me as a person, I always tell my friends, I love you so much. I get very overwhelmed with how many text messages and emails I wake up to every day as a YouTuber, especially. So it will take me a long time to get back to you, maybe even up to three weeks. So if it is an emergency and you need my answer right away, you need to say, Brittany, answer this. It's important. Because otherwise, I I am very, okay, I only have so many spoons. I get very overwhelmed. And I want to just make sure I get the big stuff done every day. And then the side stuff I can. But if my friends are hitting me up, and look, as a YouTuber of 12 years, like, you can imagine I've met a lot of really cool people over the years. I've got like hundreds of people in my my inbox or my in my phone numbers in my phone book. <laughs> so you can imagine if, if I, like 10 of those people just hit me up every day to say, hey, how are you doing? That would be too much, right? So I will say that this is a skill that I've learned over time is accepting and meeting people where they are instead of projecting a sense of what they should do on top of them. It's my job just to say, oh, yeah, that's my friend, blah, blah, blah. And they don't text us frequently or, hey, that's my buddy. And he only hits me up about work or, hey, that's my buddy. And they only hit me up like here. So instead of projecting what I want onto them, I fully accept what I have and you know, what I need. And then I ask myself, do I need something else for my friend? If I do, I negotiate with them. Hey, I actually would like it if we talked like a little bit more frequently or hey, are you good? Do you have the time to talk to me less or not have the time to talk to me less? Like it's okay if I ask for less time. I just negotiate now because I don't know what people want. And I have so many diverse friends from all over the world, diverse people I talk to, coworkers, um, YouTubers, you know, people I meet online, my friends. It's just, it's hard to know what everybody needs, but that's why I just need to ask. I need to be more clear too. I'm not always the clearest, but I'm I'm going to work on even being more brutally clear with people. They start to feel abandoned. Remember, they start to suffer more than you do. So whereas like fear of abandonment may hurt you mm. a little bit, like it's really intense for them and lasts for a whole day. Mm -hmm. And then what they start doing is they start engaging in behaviors to kind of bring you back. And so then they'll start texting you really toxic stuff, right? Or it'll like, they'll like, like bounce between like really toxic and like really sad things that like really pull at your heartstrings. So what I did is I isolated and I self-harmed. If I was really frustrated with how people were communicating and I saw it as a rejection, like I was dating this guy newly and we connected really well, but then he wouldn't text me back for like four or five days. And I knew he was just at home playing video games. So I always felt like, why are you doing that? And then I realized like, okay, this is just who he is and I can't expect him to message me back. But what I really learned too is that I noticed that to, in some people, the not texting back is also a sign that they are neglectful. So what I've learned to figure out is, is this your personality type? Like, are you just not social? Or are you the kind of person who literally just neglects your phone because you're so addicted to something you're doing outside of it, which in that case was the case. So I had to really question myself, OK, is it me? Is it his personality or is it a problem he has that I, you know, that I need to be wary of moving into that relationship? Now, I learned this the hard way. I dated people. I dated that person. I did so many things that were mistakes to get to be this person today. And I'm glad because this person today actually found her person. By going through all that stuff I did, I really prepared to be his wife without knowing it because now he gets the healthiest version, the remission version, the person who's like literally not up and down every day, but is still a person who gets stressed pretty, I think probably easier than the average person. Maybe, I'm not sure. Because I'm a YouTuber, I have no way of knowing what is normal stress for people because I'm just stressed every day because my job, you can imagine, you're getting emails every day telling you to eat a gun. You're getting all these messages telling you you don't know who you are. You're getting messages saying you're a bad person. So you just have to be very self-aware of, yeah, you're going to feel stressed. This job can be stressful. So, you know, make sure you communicate with your partner to give them some sort of consistency. I'm so worried about my partner that I'm always like, are you OK? Are you OK that my job is stressful? Are you OK that I'm up and down? Are you OK? And thank God he's such a good communicator. We just end up reassuring each other that like everything's still fine. We're still working within our values and we're going to continue moving forward in a healthy manner. They're like apologizing. I'm so sorry. I'm crying like, oh, my God, like, will you ever forgive me? And it's like then you feel like an asshole. They make you feel guilty. So you're like, yeah, of course, I'll forgive you. It's okay. Yeah, right? I go silent. So it, it, it's like your emotions. Be Which is sort of a form of punishment. I just go like I self-loathe and I turn off my phone and I just go and I sink in my loop. But again, I'm three plus years clean of doing this behavior. Come this ping pong ball. And why do your emotions become a ping pong ball? Because their emotions are a ping pong ball. Mm -hmm. And they're kind of getting bounced all over the place. Which brings yeah. us to the, the second thing that's very common in BPD relationships, which is the feeling of mixed signals. Mm. Well, kind of like a pendulum. This kind of comes down to this fear of abandonment. So sometimes mm. what happens when people have BPD is when they're engaged in a relationship, you know, what's going to happen is like they're 
things are going pretty well and y'all are having lots of fun. But in the back of their mind, they've been abandoned so much in the past, right? Because they got abandoned as kids. So there's like that seat of trauma back there. And then they've had so many relationships, which were so amazing. And how did those emotion uh, relationships always end up? The other person always ended up leaving, right? Because I'm actually the lever in the relationships. Um, but I th I think past Brittany has such a good background and foundation because even though I am borderline because of the way that I was raised, I also have a sense of security because of the way I was raised, which is why I think I'm higher functioning because – Again, even though my parents were wrong in one way, they were pretty good in other ways. So I always had this like foundation to rely upon. So when I and I was right, by the way, all the people I've dated have always been bad for me. But I also was a person who was willing to date them, which means I wasn't doing too good myself. You feel. But the fact that I ended my last relationship before this current one, I went three years clean, like no dating, no nothing except for first dates, usually on Zoom. And I was really strict about dating moving forward. I think that I was able to pick the right person now and not fall back into that trap of dating toxic. But that only came because I solidified my values, my reason for existing. I stopped being suicidal. I got my life back together. And I made a decision to be the main character in my life, to maintain that I am in charge of my life and that I get to choose what I do with my existence or my existing rather. So I really took hold of my agency on top of having borderline and PTSD and all these struggles I've had to deal with, I overcame. And I think in part that's because, again, I'm very much like, you don't like me, you don't need me. Like anytime I felt like people didn't want me, it's very easy for me to go, cool. And also I'm a big proponent of consent and I feel like if people don't want you, they have the right to consent out of a relationship. So people didn't really break up with me. People never really ended friends friendships with me. I mean, sometimes, but I felt like I really was the one who ended up leaving, which could be the borderline, obviously. But I also felt like I left to be better and I always did. So my trajectory has just been up. Every time I've ended a friendship or ended a relationship, I think because it was never meant to be in the first place or this was just a moment in time and now it's over. Now I can move forward in a different way. So I see, I will say like, I do consider myself quite exceptional in this way, but I don't know if that's also a part of being borderline. Like, here's the thing. I am borderline. I did DBT, but I couldn't teach it to you. I'm not a therapist. I'm just a person who was a success case of borderline. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, well, a DBT, but I don't know how to teach it to you. I don't know if there's still things that I don't even a contribute to, or attribute to a borderline but is borderline so I'm learning too as I watch this with you guys like oh there's stuff about borderline because again I'm just the patient I'm not the teacher they couldn't deal with the crazy so they left and so each time someone can't deal with the crazy it traumatizes them further increases the fear of abandonment so now what they know they're gonna sorry I do have obviously trust issues or I did more in the past I used to have like a hundred walls up to keep myself safe from people but what I realized is that I didn't need to do that. I needed to become a person that needed to have one privacy wall to be appropriate in boundaries. But I did need to have all these walls up. I didn't need to pretend that I was so special. People didn't need to get to know me. No, I'm a really great person. You should get to know me. But I'm open and have boundaries. I'm open, but I have boundaries, okay? So what I'm really learning even now as I get older is boundaries. That's like my favorite thing to work on because I am a very open person. People tend to be drawn to me. I mean, I am a YouTuber. So I have to really put down my boundaries even with other content creators, but it's really difficult because there is this like, loneliness in the world that people are experiencing that I used to have that I don't have anymore. I haven't been lonely in years. I have my family, friends, my partner. I have my whole ecosystem set up. I am literally living my best life. But because I'm living my best life, people are also attracted to that idea of like, maybe I can live my best life. Yes, you can. Just not with me. You know what I'm saying? So I will say boundaries is really important. They're going to try to protect themselves and they're going to try to protect you. And the way that they're going to do that is when things are good, they're going to start to, when is the other shoe going to drop? When are things going to go back to the way mm. that they always end up? Because remember, it happens seven times, eight times, nine times, ten okay. times. Well, so it's got to happen there, 11 okay. times, right? That's a lot of times. So then what they'll start to do is they'll start to push you away. And they'll start to test you, right? They'll start to say things that will feel a little bit weird. It'll feel really emotionally manipulative. And all this emotional manipulation, by the way, is pretty unconscious. So that's like something you... Uh, okay, so I also don't really fall into this category as much as I got older because I joined BDSM in my 20s and BDSM was all about consent and negotiation. Before, years before I was even diagnosed with borderline, I was practicing open boundaries and communication and consent being the foundation of those beliefs. So I genuinely feel like I didn't have to test people like this in the same way. 
I usually tried to see if people walk the walk and that's usually the reliability test I use. Probably the borderline, I hate liars. I don't like it. It makes me feel like you're gaslighting me. Just tell me the truth. Tell me you think I look ugly in this dress. Tell me you think I'm a little like "Mm," today. Tell me so I don't panic and internalize this idea that you're lying to me, which feels like gaslighting because you know what I mean? It's like twisting the truth. And I am a person who's worked so hard to find the truth that I don't want any non-truths um, to deal with per- directed at me, right? So I'm working on those things and those boundaries, yeah. So I'll start to like do things like, oh yeah, you know, I, I know that this week has really been fantastic and I know that we're deeply in love, but you know. Okay, so the testing thing, I usually just, BDSM really taught me, hey, do you want to hang out with me more? It really hurts my feelings that you're not hanging out with me more. Like board, BDSM taught me that before I took DBT. I know it won't last. They'll say something like that. And you'll be like, no, 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 no. I know it won't last. Like uh, negative looping. I don't really do that, but I do push people away it, when I was borderline. When I was the height of my borderline, I would be like, I don't need you. I don't need you. I don't need you. I don't need you. And the truth is, is like, I didn't need any of those people, but I really wanted them. And, but I see the problem is because I didn't date mentally stable people either. And I wasn't dating the most healthily. All those relationships should have ended. I don't think my borderline destroyed them. I think they were just bad relationships and I was going to break up with them regardless because my more healthy friends didn't like any of my boyfriends or girlfriends. They were always like, oh, you like, I feel like you're dating kind of somebody who's a little bit more toxic or unstable. Are you sure you want to date them? And I'd be like, yes, yes. You don't see the part of them that I see. And now, of course, looking back, I'm like, okay, yeah. Okay, I was really living for people's potentials at the time, and I shouldn't do that anymore. So even with my current fiance now, like we don't live for each other's potentials. We're in love with the people we are now, and whatever potentially could come out of that, great. But we're not living for each other's potential. We like the people we are now. Versus in my past relationships, I didn't even like those people. They all started off as friends with benefits. They all started off as wanting to date me, begging me to date them. And I was like, I don't want to do this. I think we're better as lovers. But then I would date them because I'd fall in love with them by hanging out with them. And then I'd get used to being with them. And then I'd want to be with them all the time. So there was really a cycle of like destruction happening in my life. And I was the one facilitating it by not putting down my boundaries because I didn't have values. Once I formed my values, it became much easier not to date toxic. Holy crap. It's like a, it's a meter. Because even if my brain goes, I can help them. Maybe I can do something. Maybe I go, check the, check the list. Nope. The list says do not engage with these types of people. Can't do it, Brittany. You know what I'm saying? My values help me stay stable. Oh, baby, like. Of course it'll last. Like, no, no, don't think that. Like, I'll be here for you forever. And they'll say, no, 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 you won't. You know, you're just saying that today, but tomorrow it'll change. See, I'm really lucky. My parents are still together. So I know relationships last. And I know you can have one without cheating or pain or derogatory words. And they are the reason I know I'm about to get married to the most fantastic man. And I am like committed to this man because he is... He's going to have that relationship with me. We're going to have it together. I'm going to be his healthy partner and he's going to be mine. And we both worked on our own before we met each other to become those people enough to at least be content with ourselves. So the reason I'm in love with my person is because he, like me, really learned to be uh, comfortable with ourselves before we dated, right? We don't need each other to fulfill ourselves. We are two human beings who are coming together to form a very great relationship, but I'm not picking him to fix me he's not picking me to fix him versus in my past oh yeah there was some romanticism of we're so toxic but we're gonna fix each other we're gonna fight each other we're gonna like you know we're gonna emo love each other it's very different then you reassure them so let's let's think about what's happening in that moment remember that they have difficulty regulating their own emotions so what they rely on is you to regulate their emotions Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. you become the mechanism of their emotional equilibrium So if Mm -hmm. I'm feeling abandoned, I'm going to be a little bit pathetic. You won't love me forever. And then what do I evoke in you? What I evoke in you is no, 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 baby. I'll be around forever. Like I love you forever. Oh my God. Oh my God. You're the one for me. And then the... That's true. I will say that's what DBT taught me. When I was in therapy, I would say these people are responsible. And then because like they were the ones pushing themselves into my life or like contributing to my irregularity. But then I realized like, no. 
I'm the person who's in charge. Wait, I can choose who's in in, in my life or not in my life, which is why I created especially a, a hierarchy for my time of friendship. You know, how much loyalty can I give a person? How much time can I offer to a person? How much am I supposed to sacrifice for a person? These were conversations I had to have with myself because I didn't have any boundaries, right? With If somebody called me, no matter who it was, and they're like, I need you, I would go help them. But Maybe I didn't get enough sleep. Maybe I got in an accident that night because I was helping people I shouldn't have. Maybe they dragged me down into their crazy because they were never getting better. But I wasn't perfect myself because I wanted that from someone. I wanted someone to come rescue me, which is why I was dating older people, which is why I was experimenting with different people. Because I was like, are you going to help me? Are you going to help me? Oh, no. It was a therapist all along. That's what I needed. And then I needed myself to rely on myself for my emotional regularity. So once I got therapy, I stopped relying on the people around me to um, keep me in check. And I relied instead on myself. The fear of abandonment goes away, right? That's great. You fixed the problem. It's beautiful. And mm. now though, something subtle has happened. So now you start to bear the emotional burden yeah. of their roller coaster. Mm -hmm. You're not only managing your own roller coaster. Now they have made you responsible mm -hmm. for their roller coaster and you've been a willing recipient. And so then what happens is they'll start to push you away, right? They'll, you'll start to, they'll say it the first time you're like, yeah, baby, I love you forever, babe. And then a week goes by and they're like, oh yeah, you're going to break up with me. I'm like, no, I won't. And then mm -hmm. a month later, they're saying it again and again and again and again and again and again and again. And it can manifest in other ways too, but they start to push you away, they start to do things that kind of piss you off. They start to pick mm -hmm. fights and then you're like, fine, you want me to leave? I'll leave. And so I don't have this relationship with my borderline. I have, I have, I'm so, no, I'm too fragile. So like this, I have seen this in people, but my borderline doesn't manifest this way. Mine's the opposite. Mine is like, hey, if you have time, do you want to hang out on Saturday? And they're like, yeah, I do. I'd really love to. And I'm like, oh my gosh, yay. And then if they're like, hey, I can't make it. Something else came up. I'm all like, hello, darkness, my old friend. They've ditched me again. <laughs> like, I am the person who's like, hey, do you want to like hang out maybe? And then when they're like, yes, but then they pull back, then I'm like, <gasps> I feel like abandoned or I feel like, oh my God, I did something wrong. Um, then I started to ask myself like, oh, why are they canceling? Why are they moving dates? And then I realized like, oh, they must have a good reason. And once I realized people had a reason, it made everything easier. Now, I might not like the reason. I might not agree with the reason, but people have reasons for doing everything they do. And so I'm just trying to be a person who radically accepts that everyone is doing what they think they need to do or that they are doing. And then I have to decide how to react to that. So instead of personalizing it and making it like, oh, they don't want to hang out with me. So they created an excuse. I just tell myself they had their own things to do. Now, some people in social bubbles do make up excuses because they don't want to hang out with you. So what I started doing is giving a giving people a reason to get out of the um, commitment because I didn't want them to feel like they were obligated to hang out with me because it feels worse if you say you want to hang out with me and then you don't. That feels worse to me than if you just say, oh, Brittany, I actually don't want to hang out with you. I'd be like, cool. Thanks for letting me know. Consent. But if people say, yes, Brittany, I want to hang out with you and then ghost me or don't hang out with me, that feels a thousand times worse, like a thousand times worse. So I think I have the opposite thing where I give people so many reasons to leave the relationship, like you can leave, you can leave, that it might feel to that person like they should leave because I'm telling them to, but I'm really just trying not to suffocate people with my desire for them. So this is what's interesting, right? Is I was diagnosed with borderline, but I don't have this experience. I could ask my family and friends to double check with them, but this doesn't feel like something I would do. I think I did it the other way, but I do think the way I did it before, like the opposite way was still a reflection of my borderline. I just don't think it's this way, which is interesting. So you get fed up and you <clears throat> walk the door. Now all of their fears have become self fulfilling. True. And so yes, then what they do is they activate a completely different mm -hmm. circuit which yeah. is reeling you in. So now that they are actually being abandoned, there's the fear of abandonment, and then there's the actual abandonment. Mm -hmm. And when they start to become abandoned, they activate a whole other set of survival mechanisms to pull you back because, oh my God, now it's happening. The sky is falling. Everything is falling apart. Engage emergency techniques, DEFCON 5. And so now they completely change their tune. I'm so sorry. Will you ever forgive me? I'm such a piece of crap. I can't believe I did this to you. You deserve so much better than me. Please mm -hmm. tell me anything, anything, anything. I'll do anything, you know? I'll do anything to bring you back. And by the way, my life has been so hard and, and you're so perfect and I love you so much. Right? Damn, this is kind of sounding like people I've dated now and I'm like, did they have borderline? 
Here's the problem. Most of the people that I date or I'm around don't want to get diagnosed. They don't want to go into a therapist's office and find this out. But now that he's describing this, I'm like, was my partner also borderline? And that could have made a lot of sense, actually, given his background. But I don't project. I didn't at the time. I didn't think about projecting that diagnosis onto him. So that's the thing, right? Is like there's so much toxicity in bubbles and people's lives that I'm not always sure. Is this mental health or just the way you were raised? Right? Like. I've seen this in a lot of people in different circles and different places around the world. Like I see this when you visit like people's homes and their auntie comes over and the way she talks is like, it's kind of like this. Like I've seen people fight in front of me, family members, cousins, like friends of friends of friends. And I will say like, it is always a question. Is it mental health or just a toxic upbringing? Is it dysfunction or is it an actual illness? Like that's always the question. Right. And this is when we get into a third thing that kind of happens. Well, actually, we'll table that for a second so then what happens is they engage in all of these behaviors they'll go full speed ahead on whatever they can do to bring you back anything Mm -hmm. you want anything you want anything you want just come back just come back just come back and so they say i've changed babe i've changed i'll do anything for you and then you come back and now you're here again right so all of those survival mechanisms disappear all of those reeling you in mechanisms disappear and now the fear that you're going to abandon them again happens again And then they start pushing you away, pushing you away, pushing you away. And so this cycle repeats over and over and over again, and people get fed up with it, and they're done. The third thing that that people with BPD do is something called splitting. Remember, it's not the bell curve, so most people aren't normal. They take that and they (laughs) shove people to the sides. So they idealize some people, and they demonize other people. This can cause Mm. real problems in treatment situations, especially Mm. like inpatient situations. I will say, like, um, so this was a problem that happened with my parents and my inner circle. So again, unless you're in my inner circle or very close to me, I don't really feel like my borderline impacts people. Um, it mostly impacts me and then it impacts people because I might flake or something. But uh, and again, I've been in recovery for over three years, so it's a little different. But my parents would have this. Some days I would like idolize my parents and then I would like demonize my parents. And I think they had it worse. Or my mentors growing up, I really idolized my mentors and put them on a pedestal. And then I would have to remember to humble myself because they're real people with real problems. And so there is a lot of like that with like adults in my life growing up, especially I had that. Where they'll idealize the doctor and they'll demonize the nurse. They'll mm-hmm. treat the nurse like absolute crap. The nurse hates me. The nurse is. I just won't trust people. I'll bottle up and I won't talk. So like one time my therapist was on vacay and I had been diagnosed with PTSD for my rape years earlier and my borderline was diagnosed by the same person. And when she had to go on vacation for something, she gave me to a guy therapist and I just like, like I bottled up when I was with him and he's like, hey, Brittany, do you want to work on your DBT steps? I was like, I don't know. And like, I just demonized him. I was like, I was so angry. I was dating a guy at the time and I was like, I'm so mad they gave me this man. Why did they make me do therapy with this man? But he was the nicest man ever. He was so sweet. I just didn't want to be treated by a guy at the time because I was having problems with my rape, right? So I I think I did this even with my therapist. I like, she was so great and wonderful because she understood me. But like that guy therapist, I was like, no. But that's, you know, a combination of the PTSD thing and the borderline. This is pathetic. I dislike the nurse. And oh my God, (sighs) the doctor is amazing. The doctor has cured my trauma. Like, you're the best doctor I've ever seen. And oh, my mm-hmm. God, I just wish the nurses were a little bit more like you. And then as a yeah. doctor, you're like, what do you mean by that? And they're like, well, they're so cruel to me. Mm-hmm. And what they'll try to do is they'll split. So they'll idealize some people, they'll demonize other people, and they can create conflict because now the doctors are getting mad at the nurses, right? Uh. Because the doctors are like, oh, my God, the patients with BPD are like, you're so amazing. You're so awesome. And then you go and you're like, hey, we need to talk about this patient and the way that y'all are treating them. It's really inappropriate the way that y'all are not behaving with compassion. And then they create conflict. I will say this is why I think I was higher functioning because I went to my therapist and I said, hey, I really understand this guy is doing his job, but you cannot give me to men anymore. I said, if you're going to go on vacation, I need to see a woman therapist because I cannot trust a guy right now. But I will say I had a hard time realizing how how I couldn't face men at the time. I went to women's support groups. I tried to hang out with just women. I had a hard time even hanging out with my partner at the time, which I'm sure was very hard for him. But it's like one of those things where I was self-aware enough to tell my therapist the next week, like, you need to put me with a female therapist because I'm I'm going to unreasonably lash out at this male therapist just because he's a man, which is not okay, right? Of course, I'm over that now. But yeah, at the time, this was re- this what he's saying right now is relatable to those instances. What does that idealization look like in the relationship. And now we got to pause for a second, right? Because when you date people with BPD or when you see these like crazy ex-girlfriends, 
on like TV shows and stuff or crazy mm. ex-boyfriends. You got to ask yourself, like, and everyone asks themselves, right? Why on earth are we dating these people, right? Mm. Like, why would you ever date a crazy chick or a crazy dude? I don't get it. It seems so toxic. It's such a mm -hmm. roller coaster. And that's because they do not understand what it's like to be idealized. Because for this person, hmm. oh my God, if you have any iota of insecurity yourself, dating someone with BPD is the best thing in the universe. I am very positive towards people. I do shower compliments, but I think that's my mom instinct more than my borderline instinct. I'm not really relating to this video as much. Hmm. Interesting. This is why people with BPD always end up with narcissists, by the way. Not always, but many times. Statistically, yeah, that, there's a that's a trope. Because what happens is they idealize you. They're like, oh my God. Oh, that is true. Okay, no, I take that back. I remember when I was, oh my God. But to be fair, coming from a religious bubble and then meeting amazing people who are poly and BDSM and it was like the greatest time of my life, that felt so good. But then I realized how toxic everyone was and then it kind of killed it for me. And that's why I left. But it wasn't the BDSM, it was the people. So- at the time, I was meeting these amazing people who were blowing my mind about like, Brittany, do you know you can just like date people who are like multiple people? And I was like, Poof. they're like, Brittany, do you know like there are people who are just like totally gay, like cool with gay people? Poof. And then I would idealize the idea like, look at these people and how they're living their life. This is this is what I need. And then every time I got it, I'm like, this is not making me joyful. This is not making me joyful. This is not making me joyful because I thought it was the people or the idea I needed. But really, it was the knowledge that I had the freedom to live life how I needed within my joy that I really needed. So, yeah. OK, this is relatable. Yes, sir. Yeah, I would definitely idealize like the people in my life until um, I realized like our values were out of sync. And then I was like, oh. I don't understand what's happening here. For those 72 hours, you're so amazing. All my previous boyfriends have been so terrible. Okay, I haven't had that many previous partners. I'm actually, like I said, I'm very self-loathing and self-isolating. So I've had three adult relationships, the fourth one I'm marrying. And then um, I had about eight sexual partners, not counting all the boobs I've motivated. So like even with sex, I wasn't promiscuous. My, my therapist asked me that. She goes, do you have a lot of sex? I was like, not really. I mean, I've had foursomes. I've had threesomes. I've had BDSM parties. I've been to orgies that I didn't participate in. I've done things, but not really. I was considered quite a prude in those circles because I was like, don't touch me. Nobody get near me. I'm very like, I'm, I had a lot of trust issues. So I have more of a isolated borderline. I think they call it quiet borderline, right? Like that's, I say I think because I don't know what's real and what's like pop psychology. But my therapist um, specifically talked about like different variations of borderline. And so that's the thing. If you look at my medical papers, it just says borderline personality disorder. It doesn't like say which kind. But I, I relate to this in smaller ways. I really think because of my background and the fact that my parents love each other and the fact that my siblings actually mean well, the borderline stuff got better faster, I think, because – I was able to humanize my family. They were able to humanize me. And even though half of them don't really understand the diagnosis, they're supportive of me being more regular. Like they're definitely supportive of this Brittany a lot because this Brittany is so much more stable. So I will say that I think I was honestly probably the best case of borderline than other people because I just I don't have these stories. You know what I mean? I don't exactly have these stories. Like I don't have a lot of I've never been dumped. Like I don't have that story. I don't have a story of like people like abandoning me a lot I have stories of people and I disagreeing and not understanding each other I have a I have like I said the same friends I've had for like 12 20 years my newest best friend that came into my life was in 2016 and he's been with me since my partner's the latest person to come into my inner circle so yeah I don't really relate hmm I wonder why that is I, I think it's probably my upbringing right that gave me a lot more stability plus my parents didn't abandon me they're still here for me so I'm really lucky my parents didn't abandon me the way I felt like I was being abandoned when I was younger. But to be fair, when I got DBT, I came home and I demanded my parents update their language and like get to know me better. And so I, I will say I was probably the best candidate for borderline. I mean, sorry, DBT, because I'd read thousands of books. I was super open to being damaged and getting better. I was OK with being the bad guy if I met I could be the good guy once I acknowledged it. Like I was really ready to be better. So maybe that's what's different here. I've uh, been abused so much. I'm so hurt. I, I was thinking about myself suicidality is very common but every oh 
It's been with me since I was eight years old, girl. Time I talk to you, it makes it go away. And oh my God, I was so hurt and everyone is terrible and I'm suicidal. But the moment that I get that penis, everything gets better. I was hoping somebody would help fulfill me when I was younger. So I would date people and say like, do you think we're meant to be together to heal each other? Super toxic idea. But I had that idea that like we were going to save each other. And I think that was borderline a lot. Make it all go away. A lifelong of trauma just with your dick is yeah. just gone. Well, see, you know what the thing was? Because I didn't get, di get diagnosed till 2018. I had already had my adult relationships. So it, uh, to be fair, for my lived experience, uh, my last relationship, him and I broke up. Uh, basically, officially, because we got back together and back together. You know, it was a messy. Um, just a, a year after getting, year and a half, two years after getting diagnosed, we officially ended things that I never contacted him again. Um, thank God, because like that was really messy. But now that I've had like three years off and I was meditating and reading more books and doing my thing. Now, when I dated, it was very easy just to do courting, to say, hey, are we compatible? Here are my mental health problems. Here's what I'm challenged by. Here's what I fixed. Do you want to date me? Now, of course, I can date healthy because I got healthy. But with this situation, yeah, I don't think I ever met someone who was like, the best thing I've ever met. I always met people and I was cynical and I had a lot of trust issues. So I'm much more like, what do you want? Why do you even like me? What's going on? Leave me alone. You know what I mean? And if you are a dude, holy crap, that is so addicting. And what does oh. that look like for the women who are dating men with BPD? They're mm. good looking. They're intelligent. They're funny. They're engaged with you. And oh my God, they have the sensitive side. Oh my God, they like cried in your arms and y'all made love and like until the sun came up and they confessed their trauma to you. And they're like, I was going to kill myself until I met you. And you found this perfect human mm. being, this, this damaged, this broken. Nah, I'm not going to lie, bros. I told my partners, I was like, hey, I'm not that happy in this relationship and I still want to die. Do you think something's wrong? And they'd be like, yeah, dude, you're just depressed and stressed because you're working three jobs. I'm like, nah, I think it's something more than that. Like, I'm very blunt. Like, I have no problem admitting. I'm like, hey, bro, I kind of want to die. Like, is that normal in relationships? My partners would be like, yeah, fighting is normal. And I'm like, this feels abnormal. So I will say, I guess I was pretty self-aware to ask those questions. I contribute that to books. Like, I attribute, attribute those to books. I think because I've read over 2,000 books, I have, like, all these ideas in my head. And I know there's a different way to exist on the planet. So I think I had more options even when I was in the throes of my self-like destruction and self-harm. I knew there was hope because I had read all these stories. I knew there was hope because I had read books. So I knew there was something more than even the state of being I was in. So I will say I really think you can get an upper hand if you have more knowledge. And this traumatized, but oh my God, you can fix him. You can fix him. They idealize you. Holy crap, is it addictive? And then mm -hmm. they demonize you. And what's so addictive about that is like, oh my God. This okay, I would do the like, you're perfect. Oh my gosh, I've never met anyone like this. I can't believe I can be this way with somebody. I'm amazed. But then when I realized like, hey, I really like everything about you, except like these things. How do we feel about that? It was always a values thing, which goes back to my upbringing. In my upbringing, you marry someone who has the same values as you. When I was doing poly, I was open to dating people who were different from me, but I realized like it really drove me crazy because we wouldn't make the same decisions. And I wanted to have kids eventually. So when it came down to raising children, if I didn't share the values with my partners, it felt a little insane to get married to them. So I will say uh, that was really difficult to navigate. And now that I'm monogamous again, it's much easier because then my partner and I are teammates. And if one of us is out for the count, that's okay. We can like be there for each other. But yeah, I don't think I could ever do poly or open again just because of where I'm at in my life. To maintain, maintain stability, I really need to be with someone who can see the world like I do. And I just met one person on this planet who does, and that took 33 years. So The next thing that we're going to touch on, so this is kind of a, an interesting aspect, is when we talked a little bit about, you know, they don't have a, a strong internal sense of self. What that can sometimes look like is people with BPD are really good at playing chameleon. And remember that they their own emotional state is kind of like a mirror of what you feel. So if you're angry, they're angry. Or if and and one way that 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 can look and this can be kind of confusing for people is that they will adopt the mannerisms and interests of people around you. So sometimes you'll meet someone and it's like, wow, I'm into underwater basket weaving, and this person is like super into underwater basket weaving. I'm into anime, they're into anime, like. Oh my God, I found a dude who like loves to like cook. Like that's amazing. Like that's pretty cool, right? So I'm, I found a dude who loves to like organize things in glass jars in the pantry. Like that's wild. And so some, some of the things that can be really confusing is when you first meet this person, they can start to become a little bit of a chameleon mm. and kind of like shape themselves to your interests. 
And then the problem is that as the relationship goes on, like that's not a genuine interest on their part. They were just kind of not really pretending, but they were absorbing a piece of your identity is really a better way to put it. And that Yes. Oh, when I would meet people, because like, okay, I've always had a strong personality since I was a kid. Everyone tells me so. But because since I was a child, everyone was telling me like who I should be and what I should do and what I should. And then on top of that, I was like being told that gay people were going to hell or gay people were or gay people were predators and I was like well I'm I'm attracted to women does that mean I am I was dealing with so many like who am I's that's why when I went on that meditation road trip and I really asked myself like who am I and what do I want I really was able to find myself once I silenced the world I was and I had therapy in my head because I had gone to therapy I was able to say who am I and then when I realized it, I just, my life transformed. I became a better person. I'm a more stable friend. I'm uh, really, I'm good at sticking to my values. I'm good at knowing um, basically who I am. I'm not perfect at it. I do need my friends and family to kind of like check me sometimes. But in general, I'm way better than I used to be. And so it doesn't, I don't need to ask myself like, who am I anymore? I need to ask myself, what am I doing now? So now I don't say like, who am I? I say, what do I want to do now that I have this information? Like, what do I want? And then I just ask Brittany what she wants, right? And then like it becomes kind of frustrating because you kind of feel like a little bit. But I will tell you, I'm so sorry. I will tell you. Well, I don't know. I'm interrupting my own podcast, but I will tell you trying new things that all my partners liked, going on adventures, it really allowed me to see what do I like? What am I into? And then I would try to figure it out. But I will say, if I don't like it, I usually just say I don't like it. So when I was dating people who like D&D, &D, I was like, ugh, I've tried this once, barely. I'm just sitting in the room with you. I don't want to do this. And people were like, why not? Why not? It's fun. But no, I'm really good at knowing like, I just don't like it. If it doesn't hit my brain in the way that I like, then I'm just not going to do it. The only thing I do when I don't have to is pay taxes and go to work. Okay? bit let on you feel a little bit deceived i don't think the deception is intentional it's just people with ppd are a little bit like a mirror where they like mm. what you see in them is what they see right so they start to become a little bit of reflection now if you're yeah. listening to this my mom would always say oh betsy you go to someone's house you come back with their mannerisms and it's true i love i always do that now too i hang out with people and then i start talking like them and like but the thing is it's like there's something funny about everybody i meet and like you almost want to be like oh that's cool i wish like that's a fun thing about you that is just yours and it makes me like think of you when i mimic you like my brother loves abba and preach and so we'll be like this is a sickness mental health and like we'll all joke around but at the same time we are kind of taking on their mannerisms we are even adding it in to our vocabulary and that's not just a borderline thing that's just a human thing i think with borderlines it's probably just amplified to an extent so i definitely relate to that you know and and maybe your fa friend or family member has said like oh my god like why would you date this person like i may be painting a really bad picture of oh my god clearly you got to run for the hills right but no actually you don't need to run for the hills like whether you run for the hills or not is ultimately like your choice and you have mm -hmm. to really think about mm -hmm. whether you, you know don't feel guilty either way but i don't want you to leave them because they have bpd but I don't want you to stay with them because out of guilt. My right. hope is to educate you. And if you decide, hey, I really want to try to build a relationship with this person, I want to try to help y'all understand this as best as you can. Okay, so how do you succeed in a situation like this? So the first thing is don't give up, okay? So like I sh shared at the very beginning, BPD is something. Man, my partner is so lucky he's meeting me after therapy because, yeah, I do. I don't think I could have dated him when I was not before therapy because I'm really a different person. I mean, I'm not exaggerating to you. In my 20s, I was like, I'm a bottom. I want to date people who like are older than me or have something they know about life. I only want to date people that are dominants. Like I was really trying to seek out sort of a mentor slash partner, which was inappropriate, right? Like different jobs. But as I got older and I don't have that anymore, now I'm more like, hey, this is what I'm doing with my life. Would you like to join me on an adventure? Or hey, would you like to combine lives and combine adventures? It's very different now. And he really is getting the best version of Britney, which I'm so grateful for. But I also think I'm getting the best version of him because he had to live out his 20s and then become the man that I would be attracted to now. And so now I'm a very different person. Like I'm dating for different reasons, closer to my age group, and I'm dating with a different goal in mind, which is stability, consistency, structure, family, healthy family relations, and of course, just a good life. Like I want to live a really meaningful, good life um, within my own understanding of what that is. And the other aspect of don't give up is remember it's a roller coaster. Mm. So what that sort of means is that even if things feel really, really, really awful, if you can kind of be neutral for long enough, the awful periods will disappear. And even mm. if things feel really, 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 really amazing, that'll kind of like normalize too. 
So in a bizarre way, what the main reason that I would say don't give up on people who have BPD is because time is actually on your side. Yes. Things will naturally turn return to an equilibrium. So like you don't have to react to a particular thing, which is the core <laughs> of the problem, right? Is they have all of these behaviors and we end up reacting to them. And then as we react to their behaviors, we evoke a whole different set of behaviors, a la scorpion. And then we end up reacting to those. Yeah. So we're sort of felt like it feels like we're being like yo-yoed back and forth in this relationship. Mm, yeah. So as best as you can, try not to give up and remember that things will return to equilibrium. So the second thing that I would strongly, strongly recommend is that you do your best to set boundaries yes. with compassion. So compassion this is actually to really with. hard, but like people with, with BPD will interpret meaning mm. in actions that you have that is not what you meant. So yes. Okay. But here's the thing. So this is what's confusing about borderline. This is what took me so long to remember through recovery. In regular life, if you don't have borderline, people will convince you that they said something that you are interpreting wrong. So the scary part is that if you have borderline and then you just deal with like personality types, you have to know how to judge if somebody's being authentic or lying to you. And then if it's your brain being the problem. So you can imagine as someone with borderline, when I'm up against somebody um, who's telling me like you're misunderstanding me, there is something to be said about language barriers, which is a thing that happens outside of mental illness, a projection issue. So maybe I am misunderstanding them because of my borderline. Or third, maybe they don't even know what they're saying themselves. It's really difficult to know, which is why there's always this like, I don't know what's happening right now, but there's a miscommunication, right? I have this with like, even even uh, like people in my life, we, well, it's different now because we can sit through it and talk through it and I can say, hey, I'm kind of feeling like this is what I'm hearing, but are you saying that? But I also know and trust those people and it's consistent with their values that they'd be open and transparent with me. So there's something to be said about rebuilding those relationships because seriously, everything he's describing that is mental health is also just things regular people experience. Miscommunication, misunderstanding, miscategorization, or a lot of people hear things that you didn't mean. Put on, um, find me a universal YouTube video where everyone understands the same message from the video. I just don't think it exists. So this is part of my work in philosophy and part of my work outside of recovery or within recovery, which is to say that there are love languages, there are... Um, regular languages like English, um, Spanish, and so forth. There is just physical language, nonverbal language. There is always a chance for misunderstanding based off of the bubble, cultural bubble you're in, or the bubble you're born into, or the bubble you believe in. Whatever you're choosing to, to filter people's ideas and thoughts through, that needs to be a good mechanism to filter people through. And that's what gets blurry is like, are you saying, you might be saying something you think you're saying, but you could be saying it to somebody. You know what I'm saying? It's confusing. So that's the hardest part I think of being mentally ill is you have to ask yourself, am I misunderstanding this reasonably or unreasonably? So for example, let's say I'm dating someone with BPD, they'll text me and I don't answer their text because I'm at work. They mm. will feel... The reason I'm not texting them is because I don't like them or I don't True. love them. Or That could happen. Absolutely. Yeah. If, especially if you have abandonment issues in general, it might be like, oh, do they not like me? Did I overstep my boundaries? I've met someone else. These are the kinds of thoughts that go through their head. And I know this because I've had tons of patients with BPD. And so what I do as a psychiatrist is try to help them understand that, okay, like you can have that emotional reaction, but the way you're reading the situation isn't necessarily. And so what we try yeah. to do is we try to set boundaries with them. Hey, I may not be able to text you at work, but you don't want to do it in an emotionally reactive way. And you want to try to do it as compassionately as possible. Mm -hmm. And the whole problem in relationships with BPD is that when we set boundaries, there's a lot of negative emotion associated with it. I okay. Funny enough. When people set boundaries with me, it, it's always helped me my whole life because I'm just like, I don't understand this rule. Like growing up Middle Eastern, growing up Catholic, growing up homeschooled, growing up specifically the way I did, you were always the weird one. So I am aware that my family does things differently. And yes, I met lots of families who are similar and lots of families who raise their kids similarly. But you can imagine when you, I went to high school for two years, public high school, that was weird. And people all thought I was weird. Um, I think a lot of them thought I was just like a weird kid in the corner, but I was also like, what is this world? Like, what am I facing? What are the rules? So even when I was younger, boundaries really comforted me. I actually prefer boundaries and I always have, but I didn't know how to place them on myself. I didn't know how to say, hey, this boundary is for me. I love you so much. Just FYI. So my, my, my fiance, one of the things we do now, and this is of course post-therapy. So like 
You know what I mean? I'm able to say, baby, I love you. I have calls all day. I have YouTube all day. Hey, I'm streaming. I'll talk to you later. Also, if he ever wonders where I am, he can just check if I'm streaming, right? So he'll know, oh, Brittany's not messaging me back for this reason. Now, that's normal anxiety. So he's just a person without borderline who has normal anxiety. Hey, why isn't the love of my life messaging me back? Oh, she's probably busy. She's probably sleeping. She's probably... I do the same thing where I'm like, oh my gosh, he hasn't messaged me back. And then I'll just check his Discord icon. Oh, if it's in like sleep mode, I'm like, oh, he's just like literally not available, right? Um, We don't really call each other on the phone. We call each other on Discord or on Zoom or something if we have to. So there's like this idea that now I can see everything he does is just who he is. But I did discover and start discovering that even prior to diagnosis, I started to realize like, okay, I have to like figure out who people are to understand why they're doing what they're doing because everyone does something that I think is weird. So with borderline, I feel like borderlines have a normal life, but it's amplified. So I feel a normal emotion, but it's just amplified, which is why it's crazy. But if you really just accept that it's the way it is and you can say, oh, hey, I feel that like emotional little like 10 times more than you. Can we talk about it? I also feel um, apathy and disdain and um, indifference a hundred times more than the average person. So sometimes I won't even be angry. I'll be completely nothing. You mean nothing to me. I don't even know why you like me. You, we're not even, what are you talking about? I'll be, I'll be that person, which is the opposite, but still I think borderline, right? Like that was all part of borderline disassociation. Mm-hmm. I don't know why you constantly text me. What do you expect? I can't text you all hours of the day. I have a life. And Ooh, that is the worst thing to say because now Mm. you have a life and you have a life outside of them and that evokes the fear of abandonment. It's happening again. And so it's this this whole cycle and mess. So instead what you want to do is set boundaries but set it with compassion. Mm. Hey, I'm sorry that I wasn't able to answer your text. The truth of the matter is sometimes when I'm at work, I, I can't afford to be distracted. Mm. I'm sorry that that hurts you. Man, I will say, because I'm career focused, I have the opposite problem. I'm like, hey, I love you. I hope you don't feel like I'm abandoning you, but I'm going to work for 16 hours straight and I'm not going to be able to message you. I actually think I run into the opposite problem just because I am so work focused and I have been even through all my diagnoses, like all of my borderline episodes, I still went to work. Actually, it was when I had a hard time showing up to work one month, I was really stressed that I ended up getting fired and I ended up going into therapy because I was like, I don't get fired. I'm Brittany. Brittany doesn't get fired. Brittany works. So I will say I have this problem where I have to tell my partners, hey, I love you so much. But I also have experienced this where I'm like, hey, why aren't you messaging me back? So it is kind of ironic in a way. But again, I think because of the way I was raised, I was also raised to be considerate. So when you're considerate by by upbringing, I think you are more self-aware. And I think that's a really helpful thing when going through mental health problems. Do you? I recognize that hurts you. I'm going to think long and hard about what I can do about that. I do really care about you, but there are some things that, you know, I can't do for you. And that boundary setting can also be in relation to like emotional regulation. So this Mm. is another key thing that we really have to do is you have to start weaning yourself off being the source of their emotional regulation. I'm not saying that you can't emotionally support them, but as long as their method to manage their own emotions is you, you're going to burn out. True. So this is where I would strongly encourage Mm. that you encourage them and maybe even with them start to develop alternate emotional regulation. So this is great advice for somebody in middle. This is, I would love to hit for him to make a video. I guess he would need to make a video on borderlines and remission or recovery because like we're chilling. But this is so true. If you're in it with that person, Give them healthy, compassionate boundaries. I love you so much. Baby, I want to talk to you all the time. But we have to, like, we have to participate in society. And when you're doing that, it's really hard to, you know, navigate those balances. But it's possible. Let's do it together. Together as a team. And skills, a great way to manage their emotions outside of your relationship is actually therapy. This is one of the times where I'm not going to say sign them up for coaching. You should see a a trained therapist because we're talking about a diagnosis, okay? Mm. You can also do things like meditation, mindfulness. There are all sorts of other emotional regulation techniques like yoga and things like that. Highly recommend. But you're going to have to start to, they, in order for this relationship to survive, there must be effort put into emotional regulation that does not rely Mm. on you, okay? Mm -hmm. So that's really critical. The next thing that we're going to talk about is a little bit weird, but this is (sighs) don't overreact to the highs, The biggest mistake that I see a lot of people uh, who have relationships with BPD make is that they hate the lows. So we're totally fine getting rid of the lows, but we don't want to get rid of the highs, right? Like, dude, when a woman tells me that the only thing in life that will, will 
fix all the trauma is my dick, that's really addictive, right? Because we're men and like we, our self-esteem is based on the performance of our penis or situs of our penis or whatever. And especially if I have an average yep. size penis or less than average size penis, like that's going to mean so much to me. So one of the key things that I found working with people with BPD and people who are dating BPD is that you can't give in to the highs as well. Mm. So you need tranquility from the highs and the lows. So if there's something super amazing that you all are about to engage in, you need the same amount of restraint, which is something that in society we never talk about, right? We're all for getting rid of the lows, but no one's like, hey, by the way, you should temper your highs. You should not lean into the best parts of your mm. relationship. What? That's insane. But the key thing in BPD is that we don't want to be reactive, right? We don't want to follow the yo-yo when it's on its own. We don't want to ride the roller coaster all the way up because as soon as we go all the way up, there's going to be a plunge. Right? So we want to stay as neutral as possible. Hmm. The next thing that we're going to no! talk a little bit. Oh, I need much more information on that because I don't I don't know if I understand that very well. Hmm. I don't know how to relate that to my life. Oh, I want more answers about that, Dr. K. Interesting. Do not ride the highs. Have balance. Yeah. It's like, is, it, is he like saying if I was being more literal? Is he saying like if you win the lottery, don't just overspend your money because you're you're like so amazed you have it? Is it like if your partner is in the highs of the highs, don't jump head first into it with no discipline? Oh, OK. Is he is that what he's saying? I feel like that would make more sense because if you have like an amazing thing happen, you also don't want to be gluttonous and abuse that amazing thing you now have because too much of a good thing is a bad thing. So is that what he means? Let me know in the comment sections down below, guys. But about is encouraging the dialectic. Yeah. So this is super cool. Okay. But there's a, one of the best evidence-based treatments of uh, for borderline personality disorder is something called dialectical behavioral therapy. Yes, ma'am. It's basically cognitive behavioral therapy. Dr. Marsha Linehan, baby. She has a book called Living, How to Live a Good Life. Living, uh, I'm, I, have a, I have a video on it coming. It's either going to be out before or after this video, so. With some amount of mindfulness and Eastern concepts mixed in. And the way that the therapy was developed is actually super cool too, because there was yes. actually a psychologist who had BPD herself, her. and she's been pretty open about this. Yes. And her experience was that, you know, treat uh, therapy didn't Why isn't he saying her name? Her name is Dr. Marsha Linehan, bro. Quite enough. And so then she got into mindfulness and she discovered like one key concept mm -hmm. from Eastern thinking, mm -hmm. which in Sanskrit is Advait Vedanta, which then she found like, okay, this is what's missing from therapy. And yeah. the cool thing is that this is not an aspect of therapy. This is actually an aspect of Advait Vedanta and the meditative traditions. And everyone should be learning this kind of stuff. So what I does agree. it mean to encourage the dialectic? So remember that people with BPD have very black and white thinking, right? They mm. split. So either you are an angel or you are a demon. There's not. This is one thing that is is not as relevant in my life because I'm I'm that's why I'm on that path of radical acceptance of like people are going to people, humans are going to human, and I can't expect people to be perfect or a demon. I can't expect that. So I'm actually actually I think a lot of society is black and white splitting right now because most of online discourse is like you're either a good person or a bad person and I'm more neutral now. Now that I've done DBT, now that I'm into mindfulness and now that I do like a lot of spiritual, I use a lot of spiritual tools even though I don't believe in God or anything. It's because I understand like people are going to people. I can't be upset just because people aren't operating the way I want to operate. Like I can't do that. I'm not allowed to think people are demons. So I don't. I just think people are good but they do bad things or some people aren't good but you know those people are rare most people are good people doing things that I'm not a fan of right like I said we're all going to raise our kids different we're all going to speak different we're all going to be different so what I needed to do was really pay attention to like again what did I need what did I want and then how do I keep myself from black and whiting? How do I keep myself from being black and white? Now, my personality is very black and white, so I can understand. My values are very strict, and I will not cross them for anybody. But I am always trying to look at people as people on a journey. Um, but it's hard. You know, it's really hard to do that consistently. But it is a thing that I think you can work on absolutely. Nothing in between. And so in the experience of people with BPD is often that if you are mad at me, that means you hate me. If you are mad at me, that means you don't love me. So they tie everything together. They cannot sit with the idea that someone is angry with me mm. and loves me at the same time. I felt I, I, kind of. I, I 
this is interesting, actually. This is kind of eye-opening because I feel like I'm very good at loving people even though I think they're trash or loving people if I think their actions are bad. Like, I'm pretty forgiving, but I think in the past I internalized it as, like, my parents would talk about gay people, like they were the worst people on earth. And I was eight years old and I was like, well, I'm attracted to women. And is that me? Are they talking about me? So I almost, like, pre-abandoned myself before my parents ever faced me. I was, like, 15 or 14 before my parents started asking me if I was gay. And then I was 21 when I officially came out. And then it was a whole thing, right? And I'm bisexual. But, you know, at the time, bisexuals were not a thing. So I have more of a relationship in the sense that it's, like – um, hey, Brittany, we really have a problem with what you've done. And I'm just like, oh, my God, like I am trash. I am the worst person who's ever existed. I do. I maybe I did do this. Maybe I am evil. I I always question, like, am I the bad guy? I, so my, I think I I really internalize all of it. So everything that every time I hear people describe borderlines as people who lash out at other people, I feel like I abuse myself the most. But I also become disassociated from the people around me. So I go like, I don't I don't know. I don't care. I don't feel anything like when I'm disassociated. I'm I'm you know what I mean? And then I have these like I've had these manic moments like this, like relationship with mania or like what I understand of mania when I'm like scribbling and thinking I'm creating the best thing in the world or like I'm driving myself by looping myself in my own self misery like I'm alone for those moments again I've been three years plus clean but like that's what's so interesting about this is he is describing behavior that I think has happened in different ways for me so I will say like I've had this happen but in a different way does is anyone relating to this I got diagnosed with borderline but I am actually pretty good at this. Like I'm extremely good at looking at people and that's people don't believe me. Like even on the internet, people will be like, there's no way Brittany thinks I've done a bad thing and doesn't think I'm a bad person. And I'm like, why not? Good people do bad things all the time. But I'm on the other side of recovery. So I can't quite remember what it was like if this happened to me in my 20s. I wonder if there's content of me out there where I could look to it. But yeah, I don't. Yeah, this is so interesting. So literally the therapy that we try yeah. to engage in is to teach people that, hey, someone can be mad at you and mm -hmm. love you at the same time. Absolutely. That someone can treat you really well. Okay, I think I projected this onto my parents. I would say, oh, I, re okay, now I get it. I think this happened with my parents. Because when I was in Seattle for five years, I didn't talk to my parents and I wasn't in my family. And I remember thinking like, no, you think I'm like disgusting. So like, I don't want to hang out with you or you think I'm a bad person. So yeah, I think I, pro this makes sense though. Cause I projected a lot of my borderline stuff onto my parents more than even my siblings and much more than I ever did to my partners. Okay. Yeah. This makes sense for me in relation to my parents. Totally. And not love you at the yeah. same time. Because the sad yeah. truth is that oftentimes people with BPD will wind up in abusive relationships with narcissists. And those mm. people will treat them well sometimes, yeah. but actually not really be invested in them or will take advantage of them. So one of the key things that you can do in the relationship is encourage the dialectic and even ask questions like, hey, if we're having a fight right now, what do you think about whether I love you or not? If we're mm. fighting, does that mean that I can love you at the same time? Or does that mean... You know what sucks? Or you know what's weird? I guess in my situation, look, the people I did in my 20s were learning. They were like lessons. They weren't my person. We weren't even that compatible, guys. Like 30 to like 60% compatible at most. My partner now, we're like 80 to 99% compatible. So to be fair... The problem is I was dating unhealthy people in my 20s. But again, I think those relationships would have ended even if I didn't have borderline because we weren't ever meant to date. Now, I, I guess I don't have that lived experience of actually dating a really good person and my borderline being the reason we're not together. I've only dated people that were pretty trashy and that, again, uh, weren't they were like chronic liars or they cheated on me. Like, I almost felt like I was so unlovable that I deserved this kind of relationship. Like, all I could get was toxic. So I will say I internalized my self-loathing into, like, this is what you deserve, Brittany. You do deserve to fight every night. You deserve to come home to a partner who, like, you know, threw your shit on the driveway because they were mad at you. You deserve to come home to a partner that cheats on you. You deserve to come home to a partner that yells at you. My current partner – oh, my God, I'm going to cry. We were cooking together because, you know, we were getting to know each other. And I would like flinch in the kitchen and he'd be like, babe, what's wrong? And I'd be like, I'm fine. And then like we would, we, I would do something wrong and he'd be like, oh, baby, don't do it like that. Do it like this. And I'd be like, I'm sorry. You know, if we don't, we don't have to cook together. If you want, we don't have to cook together. And he'd be like, Brittany, why wouldn't I want to cook with you? And I was like, I don't know. And then I realized like all three of my adult partners when I dated them yelled at me because I'm a loud, klutzy person. I'm very like 
specific and I used to fight all the time about my partners and with my partners in the kitchen and cooking is my me time it's my flow space I love to cook I feel I love cooking for people that's my favorite I always love to take food to my neighbors like I'm a big fan of that but when I was in the kitchen with my fiance um he would say hey I'm not gonna yell at you I'm not gonna hit you I am not going to say you're trash If we make a mistake when we're cooking, who cares? We'll just eat the burnt food or we'll throw it away and we'll make more food. And that was something that I just so appreciate about him because it's true. Like I have a lot of like, am I too much for people? That's my fear. My fear is that I'm too much for people or I'm not enough. Um, But I, you know, it's mostly that I'm too much. So when he says like, you're not too much, it's okay if you make a mistake making the pasta it's not a big deal. And I'm like, okay, okay. Because in the past, I would full on get yelled at, like just throw, st- oh, bless you, Indiana. I would get stuff thrown at me. Like I wasn't in good relationships. And that is, um, yeah, that was just a reflection of who I was at the time. You know what I mean? That I don't love you. And that's where you can have like a calm conversation, hopefully. And you can work at it that, hey, just because I'm mad, doesn't mean that I don't love you. Just because I don't text you doesn't mean that I dislike you. Just because you keep on asking me whether I find other women attractive and I one time Mm -hmm. say yes, doesn't mean that I'm going to leave you. Ooh, I'm too poly for that thinking. I'm monogamous now, but like one of the rules in our relationship is you better tell me who's hot because I want to check her out too. Right, there are all kinds of things and encourage that dialectic where both things, two conflicting things can be simultaneously true. I can be frustrated with you and love you. Absolutely. I can be busy and care about you. Absolutely. I can be mad at you and have compassion towards you. Yeah. So that dialectic becomes really Beautiful. important. The last Beautiful. thing, and this is also really important, is to stay <laughs> stable yourself. So I strongly yes. recommend that if you are in a relationship and you really want to make it work, which I think is worthwhile, right? That's why we're making this video. This is a video about don't run for the hills because that's what our media tells us. Yeah. Our media tells us, hey, if you've got a crazy ex, leave, right? And the internet tells you, hey, if she's crazy, leave. It tells you, hey, if he's crazy, leave. That's mm-hmm. what everyone is telling us to do, your family, your friends. But the truth of the matter is that people with borderline personality disorder are human beings. And, are- and we're sick. That's what's so sad is borderline is because of trauma as a child. So society is basically looking at one of the most victimized groups of people and just writing them off, which is so funny because you say you want to protect children. You say you want to save children. You want to help children. Think about all the adults that had something bad happen to them. So they've now occurred this mental illness. They now have this mental illness, meaning they're sick. And then the world is just like, ignore them. It's like so much for caring about children. Like, yeah, I'm an adult now but I didn't choose to be this way. And I didn't even get diagnosed until I lost my job. And I was like, hey, something's wrong. Because prior to that, I just thought I was like everyone else, but with depression and anxiety. So again, I think I learned in that moment to recognize that like, hey, you like your child self, my child self needed a lot of soothing and hope. And I'm lucky that I went to therapy in Seattle where the therapists there do give you hope. Because I know a lot of therapists don't. A lot of therapists write off borderlines as non-salvageable. But we are. We're people and we have real feelings and we do get better. Are just as deserving of healthy relationships and love and stability as anyone else. Yeah. The unfortunate thing is chances are they were traumatized at some point in their life, which makes it harder for them to successfully do that. They yeah. have so many adaptations and survival mechanisms yes. and maladaptations that dating them can be really hard. And yeah. so as you ride that roller coaster... Try to stay stable yourself. So what does that mean? That means sometimes seeing a therapist yourself. I tell my partner all the time, and even though I'm in recovery, the stress of my job, the stress of my life, I tell him, you need to take time for yourself. I love you so much. So I really encourage us to have time alone, do our things. Um, Right now, we're not living together as of this video, but we will be soon. And what's going to be so important when we do is making sure he has time alone, making sure he's recharging his spoons, making sure he's self-caring. Once again, goes kind of beyond coaching. Especially since now that I have a physical chronic illness and it looks like it's going to be a lifelong problem. He's doing a lot of the cooking and house cleaning. He's going to need a vacation. So we have a favorite spa in town and I told him spa day once a month, baby, let's go. We're going to do whatever it takes to make sure we both have a break from our wonderful life because not every part of it is perfect. You know what I'm saying? I have sicknesses. It gets exhausting. You know, it's going to be exhausting. 
if your problem is like, hey, I have trouble getting out of bed in the morning or I'm trying to figure out what to do with my career or like, you know, whatever. If you want to learn how to meditate, get Dr. K's guide, whatever. But if you're in a relationship with someone with BPD, I'd strongly recommend that you actually see a therapist. And so do mm -hmm. everything that you can to stay stable yourself. Because mm -hmm. remember, there's... Sorry, my partner and I are big fans of therapy. So I actually am going to go back probably for my PTSD because I think I could be doing better with that because I got triggered recently and it really frustrated me that I was like, oh, I'm like, I'm that's not where I want to be with that. That's the thing that's so cool is that we are pro therapy. So we never have to worry about it being an attack. Like I don't if I suggest to my partner to do therapy, he's not like, oh, you think I need therapy? He's like, oh, do I need that tool? It's like saying, hey, babe, do, should we go back to the gym? Like, that's what therapy is to us. Do we need a tune up? It's not like this evil thing. You know what I mean? Your sense of self relates to who you are, right? They become a mirror. So the key thing, and this is how relationships help people with BPD, is that the more stable you are, the more stable they will become. So don't mm. give up on them because they're wonderful, beautiful human beings. And don't Thanks. fall for the highs or the lows. Good luck. Thanks, Dr. K. So one last kind of like oh. quick disclaimer. So a lot of the stuff in this video has been kind of like hyperbolic. And I want to share with you all that the actual experience of people with BPD and a lot of these examples are like widely variable. Cool. Right? So part of the challenge of trying to educate people on the internet is that I try to say things that will resonate and connect with people. Mm. But at the same time, I could be playing into and exacerbating stereotypes. So from the bottom Good, of my Dr. heart, K. if I've offended anyone, I'm really sorry. I try to be entertaining and educational, but I want all y'all to understand that what we were talking about today was sort of hyperbolic. And there's mm. actually a lot of variability with the way yeah. that people with BPD will well present said. and manifest. Well said. Well said. Yay. That's such a good disclaimer. Okay. So that is such a good disclaimer. I agree. That's why at, at parts of the video, I was like, I don't know if I relate to this, but I think that's what's so interesting and beautiful and wonderful and scary about the world is we're all having different relationships with reality. So for me, I really needed a therapist who was going to be kind, consistent, and tough love. Someone who was going to say, Brittany, you can do what you're going to do no matter what you do, but here are the consequences for these actions. And then I was able to handle or not handle consequences. Like I really love and like commend my therapist for working so well with me. And this was years and years and years ago. I She's probably seen a thousand clients by now and doesn't even remember who I am, but you changed my life. And I am so grateful for it because girl, I had gone through therapists and they were wrong. I had been with people who wanted me on meds I never needed. I know people who told me I should just you know, unalive myself because I wasn't worth, like I'm not worth existing. I mean, I get messages like that every day, but that's just the internet. You know what I'm saying? I am living proof that you can recover, that you can be in remission, that you can admit out loud and proudly, I'm not feeling well today, but this doesn't define me. Or, hey, I'm feeling great today. And even if I don't tomorrow, today's still a great day. And I think there's something so profoundly important about this. Like, I do not care what you read on the internet. If you want to get better, you can be the exception. I don't care how many statistics you read, though helpful, they don't account for the individual experience and they don't count for the exception. You can be the exception too. You can recover and get better. You can be a part of the positive statistic that 16 years of real therapy or understanding of the self, 16 years of being aware of your borderline could possibly cause you to get rid of it altogether. I love this idea. I love all the possibilities. When I was in therapy, I was told that people can recover, but I really aimed to be joyful. That's what my therapist told me, and that's what I'll leave you with today. Follow your joy, no matter what it looks like. Make sure it's joy, not happiness, not temporary dopamine, not like monetary value, but joy, something that comes within, something that gives you a sense of peace and understanding of yourself, whatever it looks like. For me, I thought I was going to be a boss lady in a company. No, I ended up being a homebody YouTuber who's falling in love and, and living a very simple and humble life. I always thought I was going to be flashy. I always thought I was going to have like cars or houses or mansions. And then I realized like, I don't want that. I want humble existence. I want to live a normal life. And I just so happen to be a YouTuber. I want to live a normal life. And I just so happen to be have borderline. I want to live a normal life, even though I have PTSD. I just want a happy life, a peaceful life and a joyful existence or existing. Yeah. All right, guys, please leave your comments in the section down below. I'd love to hear from you, especially for people who are also diagnosed as borderline. I'd love to hear your opinions. I'd love to hear how you have relationships with yourself. I'd love to hear how you feel about boundaries. 
This was great. And I'm so glad this was recommended to me. So thank you guys for doing that. With that said, I will talk to you guys very soon. Bye. I'm just fine, yet all I do is whine Not to you in my mind, cause I know I don't make sense I've been nothing but blessed So why's my life a mess? Please tell me, cause I'm sick of thinking Yeah, I'm sick of reaching out for the truth And living life as a fool Da da da